McCarthy, who's CEO of the Farmers Journal. And you're both very welcome. Thank you for being here in the studio. Oshin, how important is this updated plan tomorrow? And, and what are you looking for? What are the key things you're looking for? So it's a big step. I mean, we've heard had a lot of climate news over the last year or so, but this is the first plan done under the new law that was passed last year. So it's the first plan since we had those carbon budgets for the national emission ceilings and now the sectoral ceilings that you mentioned from the summer. And therefore, this plan is legally obliged, so to speak, to match those targets. And mm-hmm. the ministers who have the individual sectors, whether that's transport or electricity or uh, agriculture or buildings, are all responsible for having a plan that matches uh, their targets. So this is a new, this is unusual in Irish, in Irish politi- politics and policies that ministers are, are, are legally li- uh, re- uh, responsible for, for what their plan is. So the first question would be, does it add up? Like, does it overall add up to, to the limits we have adopted by, by all the parties apart from main two in, the, in, in, in Parliament? And does it add up to the individual sectoral ceilings? And then we need to see big um, um, policies and measures in all those key sectors, so electricity, transport, buildings and agriculture. And the uh, Taoiseach said at the weekend that his ambition is to strengthen oversight <coughs> and that that would be managed from the Department of the Taoiseach. Is that something that you would welcome? Yes, that is good. I mean, there is a unit there now uh, that, that ha- is imp- responsible for implementation of the plan along with the minister, the ministry in, in Eamon Ryan's department. And they've been doing a good job, but they probably need more resources because this is a very big plan and has, like la- the last one, had 450 or more uh, measures across government. So in order to keep, make sure, like they did for the action plan for jobs uh, back during the mm-hmm. recession, is, is, are the departments actually following up? Historically in Ireland, we have an implementation gap, even when we have good policy. And just on, on the transport issue, how in reality, because we hear about reducing car journeys in distance terms by 20%. How can yes. that be done well, in real terms? This is not the government coming for your cars. This is the government doubling down on providing uh, cycleways and safe routes to school for walking as well as cycling and public transport. I mean, the, it's, it's about making the alternatives to the car cheap, reliable, convenient and safe if it's for cycling and walking so that cut by 2030, we just don't need our cars as often. So there's also planning involved, as in uh, ultimately we need to make sure our houses are closer to our schools and our amenities uh, and our jobs rather than rather than they are now. But in the meantime, it is it is that investing in cycling, walking, uh, uh, and uh, and, and congestion charges. Yeah, well, I, certainly I, I I don't know whether congestion charges will be announced tomorrow. I, I think we should be having congestion charges in the cities and uh, interest-free loans for electric vehicles in in rural Ireland outside the cities, where you are going to need your car for longer uh, until we have uh, you know, public transport that's every village, every hour. You're going to need your car for, for longer. In Dublin, there's plenty of alternatives and we need to free up road space for the cycling and the walking uh, and the public mm-hmm. transport. It's like the retrofit. You know, when you say interest-free loans, people just hear loans. They don't want them. They don't want to have to take out a loan to buy something that perhaps they feel they don't need to buy, but the government would like them to have it. Well, you don't have to take out the loan, you don't have to get it, but I mean, we do need people to, when they buy their next car, we need to make it as 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 attractive as possible to buy an electric vehicle. So you need, we need to have the infrastructure in place and we need to have the financial mm-hmm. uh, supports in place, because we do need to get combustion engines off the roads as much as possible over the next 10 years. So Norway is going to ban the sale of, of any new combustion engine from 2025. Justin, they're not coming for your cars, uh, says uh, Oshin. Are they coming for your cows? Yeah, Claire, I, <clears throat> I think it's very important, and I hear this narrative of cars and cows, it's very important to make the distinction. If we're looking at achieving a territorial emission reduction target, moving people from your car to uh, public transport is a net dividend, both territorially and internationally, because it reduces emissions. Uh, Clamping cars and culling cows are not the same, though, because food production is a globally demand-led industry where if you cull a cow in Ireland and move that production to another part of the world, you're actually having a negative impact on international emissions. And the real Well, then change the demand. Well, uh, but, but at the end of the day, Claire, all of the narrative and all of the calculations are based on production. Actually, there is a very, very strong uh, argument to be based on demand-led because agriculture, farmers don't produce food for it to go into storage anymore. They produce it for it to be consumed. And if we look at that demand, what you talk about, Claire, there's a lot of policy idealisms out there rather than reality. Uh, over the last 20 years, meat consumption across the world has increased by 60%. Last year, the world ate more meat than it ever did before in 20 
2022, it will set a new record. The UNFAO are talking about demand for food increasing by 28%. Demand for beef and dairy products that Ireland produces and produces very sustainably is going to increase by 15 to 20% by 2030. So you're saying we should continue <clears throat> to meet that demand rather than globally try to work on changing the demand? What I'm saying, Claire, if tomorrow we see uh, a, a policy that's driven by achieving a territorial emission reduction target and significantly underpins the, per, the capacity of Irish farmers to produce food. It will achieve a territorial emission goal, but it won't actually solve the real problem. And the real problem is... So this is, is back to that argument. We can reduce our emissions, but in India, they're going to be doing X, Y and no, Z. In China, they're going to be no, doing... No, it, it comes back to the argument as to what is the problem. If the problem is, or the challenge is, to achieve a territorial emission reduction target, we should be reducing agricultural productivity in Ireland. But if you accept that the problem is feeding a rising world population whilst reducing the global environmental footprint of food production well then are significantly reducing food production in Ireland is not, the pro uh, is not the solution. It achieves a territorial emission but okay. adds the overall well, problem. What do you but, say to that Oshin? Well I do think we were past this debate because to say it again, nobody in the world is going hungry tonight for a lack of Irish beef and dairy and of course there's both a supply and a demand side to this but like the boat uh, like having a consumption based international climate regime, that boat has sailed we have uh, both internationally and now legally binding nationally targets for territorial emissions, for what we do here in Ireland. Now, that isn't to say we, we have no interest in what happens in the rest of the world, but in other, in other areas, we don't, we, we don't say, and I don't want to make the analogies, we don't say just because there's a demand for something, we have to supply it, because it would be worse if somebody else did. In lots of cases, we say, there should be less of this going on, we won't supply it. We, we, we provide 10 to 15% of, of, of the world's baby milk powder. Do we, how much of that do we think there should be? The same is true of meat and, and, and some Fair, Today, dairy. deforestation in the Amazon rainforest is running at its highest level since 2000. Yet, up 11% on last year. To put into context, in the last four years, Brazil has deforested, deforested alone, the same amount of agricultural land as is, is informed in the whole in, in Ireland. So that is where we're going. Why is it doing that? Because Brazil is looking at those UNFAO figures and seeing demand for beef and dairy products rising, and they are preparing themselves to meet that demand. Does that make it right? And does that make it right I, to, 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 to aim to feed people who have this desire to, to eat beef? Yeah, like we're not looking at, at changing what we supply because things are going to change. Globally, things are going to change. That demand is likely to change as people, yeah, as awareness around the environment changes. Tonight. The UNFAO predict that two and a half times more people are facing food insecurity than they were in 2019. Justin, you know I said because of a lack of Irish beef and dairy. So oh. plenty of people, the grain ships that came out of the Ukraine, the first three, first three, one of them came here to feed our animals. But it didn't but, go to Ethiopia but, but, or to Somalia. That's not sustainable. But that are just. Let me let me just uh, clear. If we want a policy, if we want to actually tackle the real issue of feeding. Uh, more people producing 30% more food by 2030 whilst reducing the environmental footprint of global food production. What I am saying is we need to reduce the emissions from Irish agriculture. I agree 100% with Oshin Coughlin, 100%, and we can do it. And I would like to see innovative policy measures coming forward from government tomorrow that actually helps farmers produce the same amount of food from less cows. And Oshin, you might find that strange me saying it, but I've spent 20 years of my career advocating to farmers that technical efficiency and environmental sustainability go hand in hand. We have... So you a, agree with the 10% reduction in the herd I ambition? With, uh, Claire, is how we go about doing it. What I would like to see is policy innovation that comes forward to helping farmers produce more from 90% of their herd and naturally see the inefficient cows and whatnot moving out of the system. So there's no point of disagreement then. If, if no, you're agreed on 10% reduction as well, you're both saying that that is doable and acceptable. Claire, well, I for think me, it's about the narrative of how you go about it. Talking about culling but, cows. But nobody, no, the people who talk about culling cows are normally the, the farming interests who set it up as a straw man. We, we have never spoken about okay, culling I'm, cows. I'm, ag I'm agreeing with you here because I think we have much more to gain by working together on this issue. What I would like to see is innovative measures coming forward tomorrow in the Climate Action Plan that incentivize farmers from getting more out of the 80, 85 percent of the cows that they keep, that uh, reduce the age at slaughter, that use better genetics, that help them get more from grass, use less nitrogen, and a lot of these are contained within some of the reports that the farm organisations are looking for. Can I make two, th two points on this? So I, I think there is, which is a pity we didn't get to that sooner, there is, uh, there is significant grounds for, for, for agreement there. Again, because no one's coming for the cows. Mm -hmm. What they are coming for is the pollution and the, and the pollution is going up and it needs to come down. And one of the key things has been a fertiliser. One of the key targets in the existing plan is fertiliser. And fertiliser use has dropped significantly this year. And actually, may, they may have already met the target that they set 
for 2030 because of the price rise this year. So the key thing is how do we keep that mm -hmm. down now? How do we lock in those gains? And unlike, say, congestion and, tra and, and, and cars don't rebound like we did after COVID, how do we, how do we lock in those gains? And, and, I'm looking for that to, it, tomorrow's plan. I, I, I agree with Oshin on that. Uh, what we, got, we have to accept that maybe nitrogen was too cheap, Oshin. Maybe we, as, a, as an industry, and I think this is where there needs to be a growing up and a, and a serious debate uh, around this and be proactive and positive on it. And I think oh, what Oshin is saying on nitrogen, that we can do more more with nitrogen, we need to get our soils in better condition, we need to get our soils in better health. But what I would say, Claire, is we produced a KPMG economic impact assessment prior to this, uh, and prior to the government setting even the 21 to 30 percent, and it showed that with the, all the technology rolls out, we can get mm -hmm. to about 18 percent. Getting from 18 to 25 percent is going to require a reduction in guys. What I would like to see is a, a debate on how do we get keep maintain food production by getting more from less cows. It's interesting that farm. you accept that, and Oshin, you accept that, that, you know, we can get the same amount in terms of productivity from a smaller herd, but the Minister for Agriculture doesn't. No, uh, Claire, what I'd be very clear on is that we should be incentivising it. What, I, what annoys me and what frustrates farmers is that we're doing it through negative subsidisation and increased legislation. Uh, and what you talk, the Minister saying there will be nobody forced to reduce cut yeah. numbers, but if you take vital income supports away from from beef farmers that were there to help them keep the cows. That is forcing them. So when we hear about this reduction happening voluntarily through diversification, you believe that will be forced on farmers th using economic measures? I hear measures. Ryan talking about this panacea of diverse income streams. He has yet to tell us what they are. I, I, I'm a bu uh, farmers are business people. Claire. Certainly, they will respond. Well, what are they, Oshin? Do you know? Well, I think we'll probably hear more tomorrow. But I, but from what I've what, what we hear in the, in, the, in the discussions over oh, so far, it's things like solar on, on your farm. It's things like forestry, uh, and and it is then the technical innovations around multi multi you know different grasses. Mm -hmm. and so forward, so yeah. like I think I think there's plenty of uh, a basis for moving forward. Uh, but but it will be it will ultimately be more than just those technical fixes. They won't, as you say, they won't get us all the way to 25. percent So do you accept then when Charlie McConnell says government will not cut the national herd for well, emissions first, target. So first of all, like, there is no such thing as the national herd, as as as, as we'll agree on too. Yeah. There's like lots of, of, of farmers who own some own cows, just like there's lots of individuals who own cars. So the, the government hasn't got the power to cut the national no, cut the herd unless they did. Like you know, when there's foot and mouth or something, that there, there are state backed culls. So it will be about how biz, how small businesses, i.e. farmers and some big businesses, uh, choose to to invest over the next ten years but because it, of, of it'll, the economic it'll happen. It'll happen through economic well, pressure being being put on farmers. Yeah, I mean, st in the same way as, as we, uh, we talked about cars, we talked about, I'd love to talk about buildings briefly before we finish, it's the incentives we face, whether there's the supports we need to change our investment and our, and our behavior or whether there isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that won't I, I all be what you're saying There's there. plenty of agricultural supports. I mean, I think it's okay to, to have some... Listen, um, J J Justin, can I ask you about the, the transport ambition as well, to cut car journey distances by 20%. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of your readers would live in rural Ireland. Yeah. What will they hear when they hear that. Yeah, I, I, I think, and again, to put the cars in the context and, and the cow numbers in the context, I, I, I look at CSO figures and I see car numbers increasing by 60% in the last 20 years, car yeah. numbers increasing <coughs> by four. So I think, Ocean, you and I are on the same page. Maybe where we differ on this slightly is I know a lot of the readers of the Farmer's Journal, uh, their their kids could be three, four miles from the schools, Ocean. And I think you would accept this, that, that there's there has to be nearly a two-tiered policy for people living in urban centres and people maybe more remote and I think it's a phased process of, as you say, every uh, what was it? Oh, every Fawcett, village, every hour. Every village, every hour. And that, that's a very, very good slogan. But today, that is not the Correct. case. And uh, certainly a lot of the readers of the Farmer's Journal living in rural towns and villages, getting a, a cycle lane or getting a, a, a footpath to their school is is not uh, even on the radar at, the, at this stage. Getting a road without potholes might be mm -hmm. more of an ambition. So then there'd be the people who'd be interested in the interest-free loan for the electric vehicle. Uh, interest-free loan, Claire, like, loans still have to be paid back. Even if they're interest free, you but still people, need but income. People buy cars all the time. The question mm. is, what's the next car you buy? Yeah. And, and what, what, what choices do you face? And, yeah. do, and do we make the electric vehicle uh, a, 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 re, a, a, a viable choice for more mm. people who, who, who need to make car journeys yeah. the next time they do buy? Do you know how much a, an electric I car is? You know, and, myself. Yes, and, and, and people might be looking at changing their car for a car that's 
I don't know, four thousand euro. Not something that's forty thousand euro. But I, mean, I think we're talking about we're talking about new car sales. Obviously, the second hand market is, is, is going to continue uh, uh, as it is. So, Claire, there's uh, a lot of there's a lot of Dublin raised cars in rural Ireland. E.g., they spend a period of time in Dublin uh, and then they're bought second hand by r- rural people with maybe low miles and low wear and tear on them. So, like it is, uh, th- this this isn't a problem uh, that can be solved. But I do agree with Oisin. The first step in that is uh, every hour, every bus, or 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 or, or what. The slogan is, is to get the infrastructure in place. I even see some of our own staff now with remote working. Our staff are scattered out all over all over Ireland, and they are using bus and public transport now to come to the office maybe one day a week or two days. Mm-hmm. A week. It's like you say, Ocean with the fertilizers, the cost of fuel thing that's, mm. uh, that's driving that as well. But I think if the infrastructure was there, uh, there would be uh, and it would be a move. I tell you what, Charlie. I think you mentioned schools. We should be. There was talk of free school buses for everyone this mm. September, but then the, the supply wasn't there, isn't there, so we need. We still have time before next school year. Every child that lives more than three kilometres away from, fr- from the school should be guaranteed a bus okay. place by next September. You're looking that, that begins to yeah. shift. Just, just before about. we finish, Oshin, you're looking for something on new gas boilers as yeah, well so tomorrow. The for Government says that from 2023 there should be no new gas boilers in new build homes. Yeah. Um, but that needs to be made into an actual policy but in the building regulations. We need to see that tomorrow. And then not, not to connect any other new other homes to the gas network. It'll be a while before we get them all out of existing homes but not into new homes. Right, that's a big ask. Uh, we'll leave that one there.